Hi, my name is Jacqueline Harris. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Computing Science at the University of Alberta and the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. I'm also part of the CONP Scholar Program. And today I'm going to be talking about some of my research, which focuses on using resting state fMRI to predict treatment outcomes in depression. When it comes to treating depression, there are a number of effective treatments available to choose from, including different kinds of medication, talk therapy, and neurostimulation. Unfortunately, we don't know what treatment is going to be effective for which patient. For example, studies have shown that only approximately one-third of patients will respond to their first medication. And there's currently no way to know who those people will be. For many patients, this means a long and frustrating road to recovery as they trial different treatments and wait to see if they work. Working with the Canadian Biomarker Integration Network in Depression, or CAMBIND, I've been investigating ways to shorten the path between when a patient is diagnosed and when they are matched with a treatment that is going to be effective for them. In particular, I am interested in how data collected from resting state fMRI can predict if a patient will respond to a specific treatment. One way to do this is using machine learning. In this approach, you can use historical data from patients who have already tried a specific treatment. Here we know which of them did and did not respond to that treatment. We can then use this data, which is comprised of information about the patients prior to starting treatment and the response labels, and use them to train a machine learning model, in this case a classifier which will map from the unique characteristics of an individual to their corresponding response label. Then, when we have a new patient who we don't know whether or not they would respond to the treatment, we can use the trained classifier to make a prediction if this treatment would be effective for this particular patient. One of the most important considerations in building these models is what information about the patients will be used as inputs. These inputs or features need to provide information that is relevant to the predictive task, but are also constrained by the number of total features that can be included relative to the number of training samples. The inclusion of noisy features or those irrelevant to the predictive task may also hinder the model's performance. My work focuses on the use of resting state fMRI, where a series of three-dimensional images of the brain are acquired over time while the subject remains at rest in the MRI scanner. This provides a time series of neuronal activity of the brain while not performing any sort of task. For each voxel or three-dimensional pixel in the image, we then have a time series of intensity, which corresponds to the neuronal activity in that location. Working directly with these time courses as inputs to our predictive model is both not particularly informative and also too high dimensional. One approach we can take to this is to use functional connectivity. This is typically done by calculating the correlation between every pair of time courses. By doing this, we can collapse the time dimension to a single value, which substantially reduces the dimensionality and also provides a more meaningful metric to be used in our model, representing the degree to which two regions are functionally connected. The results I'm going to show here are from my most recent work using data from CAMBIND, which is a collaborative effort from sites across Canada. It's also currently one of the largest fMRI datasets looking at treatment response and depression. Here, I was trying to predict response to acetalopram, which is a standard pharmacological treatment for depression, using pretreatment functional connectivity features. In trying to predict treatment outcomes, I compared the accuracy of different models as indicated along the x-axis with what we refer to as the default accuracy, which is the accuracy if we were to predict the majority class label for all samples regardless of their input features. In this case, the default accuracy is approximately 53% and indicated by the red horizontal line. If we feed the train models the data that was used to train it, we consistently get results above the default accuracy especially the nonlinear SVM with RBF kernel and random forest models, indicating the models were capable of learning relationships between the input functional connectivity features and the response labels. However, when the learned models are used to make predictions about data unseen to the model during training, or the test set, they are unable to perform significantly above the default accuracy, indicating the models do not have predictive value on unseen data, which would be the case if they were to be used in a clinical setting.
The disparity between the results from training and test sets indicates that the results from training are not able to generalize out, which is a characteristic of overfitting and may be remedied by the inclusion of additional training data. It is interesting to note, however, that these results contradict many studies with smaller samples showing promising accuracies in excess of 80% in test sets. This, of course, is counterintuitive as machine learning models typically improve as the number of training samples increases. However, this trend of decreasing accuracy with increasing sample size has been noted in other psychiatric applications of predictive models and is suspected to arise from increasing sample heterogeneity in larger samples pointing to the need to assess the replicability of these results in more clinically relevant and diverse samples. Given the cost and challenges associated with collecting fMRI data, reaching sample sizes sufficient to model intrinsically high-dimensional functional connectivity data will be greatly expedited, if not necessitated, by open data sharing efforts. As I move forward with this work, I hope to further investigate how to improve these results, investigating alternative methods to generate input features from resting state fMRI, and how to leverage open data resources to increase predictive accuracy. I also hope to contribute back to the Open Neuroscience Initiative by making available my code for other researchers to use. Thanks for taking the time to listen to my presentation. I'd also like to acknowledge at this point the contributions from my home institutions, the University of Alberta and Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute, Cambine and the Ontario Brain Institute, as well as NSERC and CONP for their support.